united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning. Um, I am Chaplain Zachary. Very nice to be with you this morning on this day that the Lord has made. At a minimum, it's always my prayer that Israel and we, the body of Christ, that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you this morning to United with Christ. Again, I am Chaplain Zachary, a member of Grace Chapel, um, 7601 Wilcox Drive, 79915. Um, if you don't have a church home, we would love to have you. Um, I will be sharing this morning from the uh, Gospel of Matthew. We'll be doing that uh, all this month. And we will begin with the introduction uh, to the Gospel of Matthew, followed by the genealogy, followed by the uh, birth of Christ, and then the Sermon on the Mount, um, and, and the miracles of Christ. So thank you for uh, joining uh, with us today, and we will pick up now where we left off um, this, this past Friday. We'll pick up... Uh, with the story of the Gospel of Matthew, even though it is only 28 chapters long, it is a very important book of the 66 books of the Bible. It is written to the Jews that the Jews may believe that Jesus was their promised Messiah, as mentioned by Moses. And this we find in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 18, beginning at verse 15, we'll find these words. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like unto me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. This is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God or see his great fire anymore so that we will not die. Then the Lord said to me, They have well spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like unto you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. And I will hold accountable anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. And so then, the Gospel of Matthew was written by an ex-tax collector to meet the needs of his countrymen. As a tax collector, he was ostracized from the Jewish society, and he was also considered a traitor because he worked for Rome collecting taxes. Matthew had a great need that only Jesus could see. Although he was a very rich man, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 9, as Jesus, was, as Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Both Mark and Luke tell us that Matthew made our Lord a great feast in his house and invited all of his friends, tax collectors, for dinner. He was a wealthy man, again, as most tax collectors were. Matthew tells us practically nothing about himself because he is presenting Jesus to the world. And so then, the Gospel of Matthew, written by ex tax ex-tax collector to meet the needs of his countrymen, the Jews, that they may believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Then we have the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark was directed to the Romans. Mark was the son of a Jewish woman and a Gentile man. Mark traveled with the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter gives the Gospel of Mark its apostolic authority. The Roman man was a man of action who believed that the government, the law and order, could control the world. Thus, Rome ruled with an iron fist, directly relating to Daniel's vision of Rome as a beast with teeth of iron. A great many people feel that this is the way that uh, 
one should rule. And we do see the power of a great military to strike fear in other nations without a doubt. It is true also that there must be law and order, but in fact, um, law and order is to regulate evil. There is not a law on the book for being good. We can be as good as we want to be and never go to jail. Therefore, all of our laws are to regulate evil. The Romans soon will learn, though, that they could not rule the world with just uh, military might alone. For where does character come from? Where does the character of a nation come from? And in Christianity, we see human character at its best for society when we love God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit with all of our heart, mind, body, and strength, and we love our neighbor as ourselves. This is national character developed by Christ Jesus and Christianity. Without national character, nations rule by fear. We see that in uh, communist countries like China and North Korea and former Russia was communist. We see how um, we see how dictators and communist countries rule with the iron fist. Now, one thing about a national character that Christianity gives to a nature, we see that a vast majority of uh, Red Cross volunteers are Christians. And that is because of the teaching of Christianity to love your neighbor as yourself, to help the poor, the widow, and the orphans. orphans. So that's the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Luke is written to the Greek, the thinking man. It was written by a Gentile physician who traveled with the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. The Apostle Paul gave the Gospel of Luke its apostolic authority. And Luke's gospel is very detailed, as is the nature of a physician and a lawyer, very detailed. Luke's gospel also separated demonic spirit activity in a person's life uh, versus a certain disease uh, or natural causes. Then we have the gospel of John. The gospel of John was written directly for believers in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and the only means by which mankind must be saved. The Apostle John is known also as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and the Apostle John is the last of the apostles to die. After he writes and distributes, distributes the book of Revelation, he closes the first 100 years of a man born of a virgin who split time in half from B.C. to A.D., and in the book of Revelation, we will see the four Gospels before the throne of God represented by four angelic Christian, uh, creatures. And for that, we go to Revelation chapter 4, beginning at verse 5, we'll find these words. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God in front of the throne was the shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. And in the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings covered all uh, their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. And day after day and night after that night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is to come. And so we see now, looking at the uh, lion, the lion represents the gospel of Matthew, for Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and Matthew's gospel presents Jesus as king of the Jews. And for this, we look at the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 6, the word of God reads, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, 
and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of his righteousness, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And so we see now how the prophecy of Isaiah presents Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, as the prophesied uh, Messiah of Israel through the line of Judah. And then one of the four faces of this creature was that of an ox. The ox represents the gospel of Mark. For Mark portrays Jesus as the suffering servant of God, as prophesied also by the prophet Isaiah. And for this, we go to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, and the word of God reads, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no stately form or majesty to attract us, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, struck down and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that, be, that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord had laid upon us the iniquity of, of us all. And we see now with um, the Gospel of John, we see the Gospel of Mark, we see the divinity of uh, Jesus as the suffering servant. Now, the man represents the gospel of Luke, of the four creatures, the face of the man. And as Luke portrays the humanity of Jesus being fully human and fully God in his gospel. Luke's gospel has a apostolic authority given to it by the apostle Paul. Now, there is a prophecy uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter 2 concerning Jesus being made like unto his brethren, flesh and blood. And the word of God reads, Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. Now since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it was not the angels he helps, but the descendants of Adam, of Abraham. For this reason he had to be made like his brethren in every way, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God in order to make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." And so then we see now the, the face of one of the four creatures, that of a man, represents the gospel of Luke portraying Jesus, Jesus as being fully human and fully God. Now the eagle represents the gospel of John as John portrays the divinity of Jesus in his gospel. And for this reason, we start new believers in the gospel of John. In addition to Isaiah, the prophet Daniel teaches the divinity of Jesus in Daniel chapter 9, beginning, Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9, we'll find these words. As I continued to watch, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was, flame, was a flaming with fire, and his wheels were ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 
and myriads upon myriads stood before him. Now, this was the highest, believed to be the highest the Jews could count back then was myriads, which is millions upon millions. Myriads upon myriads stood before him. The courts were open and the books were open. Then I kept watch because of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. As I continued to watch, the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was removed, but they were granted an extension of life for a season and a time. In my vision in the night, I continued to watch. And I saw one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And he was given dominion, glory, and kingship, and that the people of, the, of every nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so we see now the Gospel of John portrays the deity of Jesus. Now, God has prepared the whole nation for the coming of Christ into the world. And as Lord Jesus himself said in John chapter 4, verse 22, salvation is of the Jews, as he spoke with the woman at the well. Salvation is of the Jews. And for this reason, there should not be a single Christian anti-Semitic in the world. No Christian should hate the Jews. People ignorantly bring a curse on themselves as God said to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And the covenant promise passed from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, who, whose name God changed from Jacob to Israel. And Israel means governed by God. And so the covenant uh, passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and passed from Jacob to his 12 sons, the nation of Israel. And so the covenant promise is still there for Israel. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And so we have an obligation as Christians to warn uh, those who may be ignorant of the Holy Scriptures, uh, who are getting their religion from Facebook and TikTok, that they ignorantly curse themselves by speaking against the Jews. Israel is the only nation on the face of the earth that God associates his name. And Israel is the only nation on the earth that must exist as a nation for all of Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. And so we see now the importance of Israel in the world as well as for all the Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. And now looking at the genealogy of Jesus, in the Old Testament, God made a promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the inhabitants of the earth shall be blessed. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, points this out and said, is a seed that is singular, not seeds, but seed as in singular, as unto the one, as unto the Christ who will proceed from Abraham, who would be the one through whom all the nations of the earth is blessed. Abraham was promised then through his seed that the Messiah would come. And this promise was repeated later to King David. God said to David that he would build him a house and that there would never cease one of his seeds from sitting on the throne. And that, again, was a prophecy, and David understood that to mean that the Messiah would come from his line. So first of all, Abraham through Jacob, whose name God changed from Jacob to Israel, again, meaning governed by God, the covenant promise was given to Judah, the fourth-born son of Leah, that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Silo come, thus then through King David. So then, if a person is to lay claim to be the king of Israel, he would have to prove that he is in the kingly lineage. He would have to prove that he was a son of Abraham and that he was the son of David from the tribe of Judah. And so then the first king of Israel was King Saul, 
and King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So at some point in God's infinite wisdom, King Saul would have been replaced because the prophecy is very clear that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah and King Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. So in Matthew's gospel, Matthew is seeking to show that Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David, and thus has the right for claim to the throne of Israel. Thus, Matthew's gospel also focuses on the kingship of Jesus as Israel Messiah, but he goes further than that, and he portrays Jesus as king of the world. Now, Luke's gospel also gives us a genealogy, but in Luke's gospel, the genealogy is that of Mary, whereas Matthew begins with Abraham and comes forward to Joseph. Luke begins with Joseph, the son-in-law of Eli, and he goes back to Adam. And we'll see that from David, there are two different lines to the throne, one through a man and the other through a woman. Here in Matthew, from David, he followed the genealogy of Joseph through King Solomon and through the kingly line so that Joseph was actually a son of David and heir to the throne of Israel, whereas Mary, her genealogy goes back through David's son, Nathan. And so from Abraham on back to Adam and from Adam to David, the genealogy is the same. But when we get to David, you find that the split in the genealogy is between Matthew and Luke. As Luke traces back through Nathan, the son of David, and Matthew traces back through Solomon, also the son of David. And this is significant because as we get into this genealogy of Joseph, we read in verse 16, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. Nowhere does it say that Jacob begot uh, Joseph, the father of Jesus. Nowhere does it say that what I, whatsoever. What it does say, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born the Christ, Jesus who is the Messiah of Israel. Now, also as we look at this genealogy that comes from David, we find in verse 12, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begot Shetel, and Shetel begot Zerubbabel. That's mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Now, Jeconias was a very wicked king, so wicked that God replaced a curse upon him in Jeremiah chapter 22. And this curse was placed upon Jeconiah in the last verse of chapter 22, verse 30. Jeremiah, the word of God reads, Thus said the Lord, Write ye this man childless. Write this man childless, a man who, that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. The curse was that none of his children would sit on the throne. So if Christ was the son of Joseph, he could not be a rightful heir to the throne of David because Jeconias and the curse that God put upon him. And so none of his seed shall prosper sitting on the throne of David. Therefore, Jesus could not be the son of Joseph, the husband of Mary, but Joseph was in the lineage of King David. So with a few minutes that we have left, this is why Luke gave us the genealogy of Mary. And coming through Nathan, we skipped his, uh, this fellow Jeconias, um, and we come down to Joseph, who is the son-in-law of Eli, or Eli was Mary's father. So the both of them were from the tribe of Judah, and they both were of the seed of David. And we see how God was very selective in choosing Mary and Joseph because they both had to be of the tribe of Judah for prophecy to be fulfilled. And there is a reason also Luke's, Luke goes back to Adam is because uh, in the spirit world, in the spirit world, in the world we cannot see, 
in a world where we have an enemy that comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. In the spirit world, dominion passed from Adam to Satan, and Jesus came to redeem the earth back to God, which is taught in the book of Revelation, as Jesus is also identified in Scripture as our kinsman redeemer. In Revelation chapter 5, we find these words. And the word of God reads, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one seated on the throne. It had writings on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look inside it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so we see now Luke tracing the genealogy all the way back to Adam because the genealogy through Mary traced back, traced back to the Garden of Eden would identify Mary as the virgin in the very first prophecy in the Bible given in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God said, I will put enmity or hatred or hostility between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We will end there for now. We will pick up um, next week and just continue uh, with the gospel of Matthew. Thank you for joining and God bless.